my name's Kate. Welcome to Emmaus Road Online. Today we're going to be hearing from the wonderful Tyler Staten from Bridgetown Church in Portland, Oregon. He's going to be preaching off of Psalm 46. Tyler Staten has come all the way from Portland, Oregon, uh, I think eight hours behind to be with us. Uh, today, we've kind of nicked him because he's on his way to wildfires, so we thought we'd, we'd nab him for Emmaus first. He's just been speaking at Aldershot. This is an amazing message. Uh, Tyler uh, he, it was formerly um, the pastor of a church called the Oaks in Brooklyn, New York, and uh, is now the senior pastor of Bridgetown uh, in uh, Portland, Oregon. He's also the quite newly appointed national director of 24-7 uh, prayer in the USA. So he is a very important man. Um, I can see Sue Leach just there. Sue came up to me a while ago. She said, oh, I'm listening to this amazing uh, American preacher on podcast. Can't get enough of him. His name is Tyler Staten. I said, well, Sue, your lucky day is coming. This is uh, that day. So um, Tyler, Tyler, just he unpacks the, the word of God in a way that is transformative and inspirational. Uh, he's married to Kirsten. They've got three very young boys, Hank, who's five, and then Simon, who's almost four, and then quite a newborn baby called uh, Amos. Uh, Tyler's written... Uh, a terrific book called Searching for Enough, The High Wire Walk Between Doubt and Faith. And um, one endorser says this, Tyler Staten is one of the most exceptional leaders I know in the rising generation, compelling, articulate, passionate, and deeply earthed in real relationships. Searching for Enough is a book of hard-won insight outworked in the streets of Brooklyn, New York. Uh, Pete Gregg, 24-7 Prayer International on Mayest Road. So, uh, now, who, who, who wants a copy of, of this terrific book? But you've got to promise that you'll actually read it. Uh, all right, there's one on the front row, so that's pretty. And then let's, let's be a bit more of it. I'm going to try right back there. Guys, please, shall I do this? We haven't done a health and safety check on this. Unbelievable. Single-handed catch. I think she was just like in a worship moment and <laughs> she's keeping hold of that book. Good for you. Uh, just before Tyler comes, uh, we're going to read God's word. Iswe Nkosi is going to come and read. Would you please, if you're able to do so, stand as a sign of reverence for God's word. This is Psalm chapter 46, Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give away and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her. God will help her at, at the break of day. Nations are in uproar, kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice and the earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see the works of the Lord. The desolations, of his, the desolations is brought on earth. He makes war cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He bends the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. So uh, we get to step two. This is my friend CJ, who's just a few months into sobriety at this point, telling me a story from his last Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. 
So we get to step two, and it turns out to be all about believing in and depending on a higher power that's greater than yourself. Now, if you're unfamiliar with the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, it's got a whole lot of God language in it. Most 12-step groups today, for the sake of inclusivity, have changed the language to higher power, but it's all based on the Bible and the teachings of Jesus as foundational and where the steps came from in the first place, but CJ's not into that part. So he tells his sponsor, Owen, hey man, here's the deal. I'm committed to the program. I really want to get sober, but please don't try to talk me into all the God stuff. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm in for everything else, but please just spare me a cosmic therapist that's supposed to help me say no to a gin and tonic. And I wonder if some of us feel like that. Teach me to pray. Sure, so long if by prayer we're talking exclusively about something that's happening in me, like some kind of spiritual meditation. I can get on board with that. There's been something of an Eastern spiritual renaissance that's moved to the West of late so that practices like Buddhist mindfulness or meditative emptying or yoga, even yoga accompanied by chanting in an unknown language to an unknown God, anything that gets me into that elusive centered state is on the table. So if by prayer you're talking to me about the Jesus version of of those sorts of things, then yeah, let's talk. But actual communication with the divine being? A divine being intelligent enough to have created me in everything I've ever seen, thought, or experienced. I mean, come on. If, if such a being exists, the odds that he would be at beck and call for conversation with me are quite slim. So a couple days later, Owen calls up CJ as the workday is drawing to a close and says, Hey, I'm in front of your place in my car. Come out. Get in. Where are we going? Just get in, man. So he gets in the car, and they drive deep into Brooklyn, all the way to Coney Island, and the two of them walk out onto the beach together on a brisk November day, and they sit down on the sand next to each other, and they just look, watching the sun that's beginning to set over the horizon and the gray-blue water that's extending far beyond their eye can see and the wind that's cutting through their jackets. And, And they sit there, and they just look, neither of them saying a word. And eventually it's Owen, my friend's sponsor, who breaks the silence, asking, you see anything there more powerful than you? And CJ just pauses for a moment, worried that it might be a trick question. Yeah? Great. Start there. Prayer starts there. See, he drove CJ where he wasn't going on his own to show him what he was not seeing for himself. You see anything here more powerful than you? In other words, can you see yourself, your tiny little self, in the midst of the vast expanse that is beyond you? Can you see yourself from God's perspective for just a moment? Owen was introducing CJ to the stillness from which wonder and prayer naturally emerges. You see, contrary to popular belief, prayer does not begin with us. It begins with God. And prayer does not begin with talking. It begins with seeing. To borrow a line from Philip Yancey, prayer is the act of seeing reality from God's point of view. So before we open our lips to say a single word to God, we have to rediscover the true posture that prayer effortlessly flows from. Be still and know. That is the way of seeing that opens our mouths effortlessly in prayer. But if we're going to discover that, we're going to need the right sponsor. And for that, we turn to David, who's got more prayers recorded in the Bible than anyone else by a long shot. And if you would, keep your Bibles, if you have a Bible with you, open to Psalm 46. I'm going to go some other places in the scripture today, but Psalm 46 is our grounding text. It's where we're going to come back to again and again. And it is attributed to the sons of Korah, which is a catch-all term or a shorthand title for this crew that David has assembled to lead prayer night and day in his tabernacle. And from that community came this famous line, be still and know that I am God. So here is the starting place of all true prayer. Be still, know God, and know yourself. 
That's a map of where I'm going to take us this morning. So first, be still. That seems simple enough, right? It's actually much, much more complicated than you'd think. And that's because the way of living that you and I have grown accustomed to as normal is in fact historically abnormal and makes stillness nearly impossible. And the historically abnormal but universally accepted modern Western lifestyle is best summarized in three major inventions, the clock, the light bulb, and the iPhone. So I'm going to borrow a bit of research to skim across the top of how we got where we are today. So first, the clock. In 1370, the first public clock was set up in Germany. And historians point to that as the turning point moment when the world shifted from measuring time naturally to measuring time artificially. Meaning that up until then, people, for the most part, had awoken with the sun's rising and gone to bed with the sun's setting. And there was this natural rhythm that had developed to life with longer days in the summer and shorter days in the winter, which I imagine is how most people must have made it through the winter before there was heat inside every building, right? Just primarily sleeping through it. And then in 1370, people start managing time artificially, and time shifts from being a limit that governs human life to a resource to be used according to an individual agenda. Fast forward then to the light bulb. In 1879, Thomas Edison invents the light bulb, which increased human productivity and greatly decreased human sleep time. Prior to the invention of the light bulb, the average person slept 11 to 11 and a half hours a night. Today, the average person, or at least as of 2013, when the last statistics were taken, the average person sleeps 6.8 hours a night. And that includes like five-year-olds. My five-year-old, I think, sleeps about 12 hours a night. So what does that say for the adult? Uh, With the increased potential for human productivity, though, technology did take off. In 1960, central heating and air conditioning, microwaves, dishwashers, and laundry machines were all common in American homes. So you can imagine that the same must have been true within the UK. Around the same time, sociologists start making predictions about when human life, uh, what human life would look like by the time you and I are currently living in, and pretty much everyone was on the same page, that this boom in time-saving technology was, will create a dramatic increase in human leisure and ease of life. In fact, in the U.S., in 1967, a Senate subcommittee jointly predicted that by the year 1985, the average American is going to work 22 hours a week for 27 weeks a year because of all the leisure time that this new technology is going to free up. In fact, leisure time decreased by 37% during that exact time span. Now, they were right about this part. Technology has continued to advance and to save us time. What they were wrong about is how we would use that time. And it turns out that we have repurposed this free time into something other than deep rest for the soul, a phenomenon that is most obviously exposed by the iPhone. So when Apple released the first iPhone in 2007, they accidentally gave us a tracking device for the use of our leisure time. What we know now is that the average iPhone user touches his or her phone 2,617 times a day, staring at that little screen uh, for two and a half hours over 76 sessions. Now that's average. If you look at just the millennial generation, the time nearly, or I'm sorry, it over doubles to spending over five hours a day looking at your phone. So instead of slowing down to the degree that we spend half our lives in leisure time, mental health professionals today have coined the term hurry sickness, which is a behavioral pattern characterized by continual rushing and anxiousness. Does that sound familiar to you at all? In a society that prizes efficiency and productivity above all else, hurry is not an occasional necessity. It has become the new normal. Be still. Not as simple as it sounds. The Christian philosopher Dallas Willard was once asked, what is one thing that a modern person could do to deepen their spiritual life and become more like Jesus? And he, after a long pause, responded, you must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. Hurry is the great spiritual enemy of our day. And I find that interesting. 
Because I do wonder if the question was posed from the front of a room like this, and what is the great enemy of spiritual life in our day, how many of us would respond with hurry? Michael Zigarelli of the Charleston University School of Business did a five-year study of 20,000 Christians in the U.S. and identified busyness as the number one distraction to life with God. Here's his summary of his research. It may be the case that, one, Christians are assimilating to a culture of busyness, hurry, and overload, which leads to, two, God becoming more marginalized in Christians' lives, which leads to, three, a deteriorating relationship with God, which leads to, four, Christians becoming even more vulnerable to adopting secular assumptions about how to live, which leads to, five, more conformity to a culture of busyness, hurry, and overload, and then the cycle just begins again. Does that cycle sound familiar to you at all. His research goes on to statistically conclude that the most common professions to get caught in this cycle of hurry are doctors, barristers, and wait for it, pastors. Now, not pastors like me, pastors like Pete, <laughs> who are more hurried and less mature, right? Now, my worry is that at this point, uh, you would think that I'm talking to you about emotional health. And I do really want you to be emotionally healthy, but what's at stake here is much more than just your ability to stay centered. Your spiritual life, your relationship with God, your ability to perceive true reality all has a very low ceiling if we do not learn how to be still. Carl Jung, the Swiss psychiatrist, whose research is the basis of the Myers-Briggs personality test, says hurry isn't of the devil. Hurry is the devil. The modern-day sage Richard Foster says, in our contemporary society, our adversary, which is a biblical title for the devil, majors in three things, noise, hurry, and crowds. If he can keep us engaged in muchness and manyness, he will rest satisfied. And a journalist once asked the monk Thomas Merton, uh, what is the leading spiritual disease of our time? And Merton gave a one-word uh, answer, efficiency. See, we tend to attribute the complexity and the busyness of our lives to a false culprit. We blame it on our environment. It's the pace of our cities. It's, it's, our work, uh, it's our workload. It's our office culture. It's our life stage. It's the current demands on our time. Those are the chief causes of my frenetic pace. But the Quaker missionary Thomas Kelly made a very different observation after spending a full year slowing down and simplifying with this 12-month sabbatical in Hawaii. And he noticed that he carried the madcap, feverish pace of his life with him from the mainland to the island. You see, the truth is that your inner life is not a reflection of your outer environment. If anything, the opposite is true, that we create outer environments that mirror our inner lives. Kelly writes, strained by the very mad pace of our daily burdens, we are further strained by an inward uneasiness because we have hints that there is a way of life vastly richer and deeper than all this hurried existence, an unhurried serenity and peace and power. If only we could slip over into that center, if only we could find the silence which is the source of sound. So that's a philosopher, an academic, a psychiatrist, an author, a monk, and a missionary, all circling around the very same thing. Hurry is the great enemy of spiritual life in our day. I want you to be emotionally healthy, but I'm talking to you about something much more serious than an overloaded schedule. I'm talking to you about your spiritual vitality. When David prays, be still, he's not trying to take us on a self-care retreat. He is undermining an ancient conspiracy. When Adam and Eve ate of that one forbidden fruit from that one forbidden tree, a conspiracy unfolds. Adam and Eve sin, and then they do what? They hide, they make clothes, they argue, they blame. They deal with their sin through what Foster called muchness and mininess, through what Zigarelli called busyness, what Willard diagnosed as hurry. And ever since then, we've always found it easiest to ignore the truth so long as we never stop moving. In the fall of humanity, we've mastered the art of hurry, of never being still. Jesus once encountered a rich young ruler who was wildly successful at a young age, and he gave him these instructions, sell everything you've got, give it to the poor, then come and follow me. 
And I wonder if Jesus was thinking along the same lines as Willard, you must ruthlessly eliminate this from your life. I wonder if this rich young ruler had become so infected, if the ancient conspiracy had buried itself so deep in his inner life that the only thing that would free this man was the full detox, ruthless elimination. But most of us, if, if we're honest, I think, feel like Jesus was being a bit dramatic here. Like, come on, Doc, is, is that prescription really necessary? So we import prayer into our hurried lives and we offer lip service to Jesus while conforming to the culture around us remains our one true God. I mean, is prayer upending the way that you would live otherwise or are you trying to use prayer to power the way that you are going to live already? Is prayer reforming you from the inside out, or is prayer your way of asking Jesus for a holy boost so that you can go about your daily agenda? We can ignore the truth so long as we never stop moving. And so we end up as good people, but as people who are not very deep. Not bad, just busy. Not immoral, just distracted. Not lacking in soul, just preoccupied. Not disdaining depth, just never doing the things to get us there writes Ronald Rollheiser. Now look, I know that's a lot, and I know how important you are. I mean, I know that you've got work demands going on, and you've got plenty of things at home. I know you've got a whole lot to think about, and a Netflix queue that needs your attention, and a social media personality that the internet cannot live without. And obviously, I'm making light of all those things, but... I really do know that you have real demands on your time, real things to worry about, real things to preoccupy you, real things that could cause muchness and manyness. But can I just remind you that David wrote this Be Still Prayer as the leader of a nation during a time of tribal warfare. I go to bed at night, occasionally with a to-do list playing through my head. He went to bed at night wondering if the enemy camped in the hill country was going to charge. And still he prioritized time for stillness before God. He went, I'm sorry, be still is the Latin vacate, from which we get the English word vacation. See, this is the invitation of prayer. Take a vacation. Stop playing God over your life for just a moment. Release control. Return to created order. Rest in God's protective presence. Be still. Prayer starts there. But that's only the beginning. Be still. Know God. Where were you on August 21st, 2017? I doubt you remember just by the date. So let me jog your memory here. That was the last time that there was a total solar eclipse uh, from our vantage point down here on Earth. It was huge news. Uh, People organized viewing parties. Many people took the day off work. Other people just went about their Monday routine while the rest of us stared up at the sky. Personally, I happened, uh, I was really excited to see it, but I was not excited enough to get the, you need to order these special glasses in advance or you're going to go blind trying to look at this thing news. So so when it actually happened, I was walking totally without glasses down 23rd Street in Manhattan. Now, 23rd Street runs right along the west side of Manhattan. It goes through Chelsea, which is a neighborhood in New York City that's home to all of New York's upscale art dealers. But it's also near enough to Times Square, and it's a major transportation hub that it's attracted chain stores and and tons of, of kind of congestion and so many tourists trying to get to where they're going to see the sights. That's where I was when the eclipse happened. And it was one of those New York moments that I will remember forever. Because it turns out that it didn't matter who had ordered the glasses or who had gotten prepared. People are just passing these things out all along the sidewalk. Everyone sharing the experience like little kids, looking up saying, you've got to see this, you've got to see this, and handing these things around. Sophisticated, busy New Yorkers for a moment returning to their inner child. But there was another group of people who were so annoyed at everyone clogging up the sidewalk to stare at the sun. 
Uh, they were trying to get by us. They were frustrated by the need to weave through the crowd. And they were using every means of communication they had except for words, right? Grunting and scoffing and intentionally bumping you with their shoulders to let you know they were there and they had some, somewhere to go. They were saying in every way they could without just coming out and saying it, I'm really, really important and you're in my way. And that annoyance was ironic because of the perspective. <laughs> because if you were to reverse the perspective, and instead of being at 23rd Street looking up, you were from the cosmos looking down, the whole thing looked a whole lot different. I mean, consider with me the fact that if our Milky Way galaxy was the size of North America, the whole of our solar system would fit into the bottom of a coffee cup. Right now, there are two Voyager spacecrafts that are cruising toward the edge of the universe at a rate of 100,000 miles per hour. They've been doing that for over 30 years and have traveled over 9 billion miles with no end in sight. When NASA sends communication to one of those Voyagers, it travels at the speed of light and still takes 13 hours to get there. The current scientific estimate is that to send a light speed message to the edge of the universe would take 15 billion years to arrive. So yes, Chelsea art dealer, you are very important. But from the perspective of what we're all looking at down here, you're also impossibly young, urgently expiring, and unbelievably small. Be still. And know that I am God. I, not you, am God. So you and I, we tend to pass our days seeing the world from behind our own two eyes. And from that minuscule perspective, we can convince ourselves that we are or at least should be in control, directing our lives, scripting our future. Prayer, though, is the act of seeing reality from God's point of view. Psalm 8, another of David's prayers, marvels at the wonder of this perspective. He says, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and stars, which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. And all of our scientific discoveries in the thousands of years since that prayer have only confirmed this profound and simple insight. In this vast expanse, who is this God? It would concern himself with the likes of me. There's a good kind of small. It comes with wonder at a God who is big enough to fashion the cosmos with his breath, but then personal enough to take real interest in the events of my day and the fluctuation of my emotions. And the great scandal of prayer is to simply let ourselves be loved by God. There's someone sitting in this room this morning and and, and there is anxiety eating away at you from the inside out. And what you need to know is there's a God big enough to fashion the cosmos with his breath, but personal enough to concern himself with the inner movements of the anxiety churning in your gut this morning. Now, I love cities. <laughs> Gritty, fast-paced, diverse cities have been my home for the whole of my adult life. I lived in Chicago, and then it was New York, and now it's Portland. I feel more at home on a crowded sidewalk than I do like in the rural countryside or in a suburban strip mall. But like anywhere else, there are pros and cons to a city. And the way I see it, the, the, the greatest of all the drawbacks of living in a major city is the sky above. Because unless you get a particularly clear night, the stars are mostly invisible from a city street. The bright lights of the heavens above are drowned out by the artificial lights below. And isn't there profound symbolism in that? That the lights of our office buildings that stay on late, that the, the, the brightness of our advertisements and, and our entertainment, it drowns out the cosmos that sits above us. All that reminds us how big we are down here drowns out the truth of how small we are that shines ever from above. It all works together to convince me that the world from behind my tiny little perspective is all there is. We've found a way to drown out the stars, a way to pretend that all I see is all there is. City dwellers like me were in danger of missing what David saw, my life against the backdrop of something so much bigger. It's just another way we found to undermine that ancient conspiracy. 
Adam and Eve sin, they fall for a deception. You will be like God. And what started with them has never stopped. Uh, the Tower of Babel, the King, King Saul, the Pharisaical priesthood, the CEO of your company, you and me, we're all addicted to ego and control. We're all prone to drown out God just to keep moving, to go about our lives like we are at the center. Stillness is that quiet space where God migrates from the periphery of our lives where we've pushed him back to the center where everything falls into place. Now, I don't know if you've ever read the book of Job, but it's basically just like eavesdropping. It's one man trying to sort out life's greatest questions with the help of his three friends, and together they just run around in circles while you and I sit like a fly on the wall, bringing the deepest parts of ourselves to community only and not to God in prayer. It can comfort us in a real way, but it can never heal us all the way. That's what we learned from Job's first 37 chapters. And then finally, in chapter 38, Job takes the conversation directly to God. He prays. And God's response to that prayer is a series of questions. Where were you when the stars first sang out? Where were you while I breathed and painted out the sky? Where were you when the angels gasped as they saw it all coming to be? And as God poses these questions, Job's perspective begins to shift. He sees his own life finally from God's point of view. He remembers who God is. And that begins a process of healing in him so deep that the second half of his life was more blessed than the first. So here is the foundation for prayer. Be still. Know God. But there's one more key ingredient to this starting place. Know yourself. In Psalm 146, smack in the middle of a whole bunch of poetry praising the greatness of God, the psalmist drops this record-scratching line. Put not your trust in princes and a son of man in whom there is no salvation. When his breath departs, he returns to earth. On that very day, his plans perish. Now, at first glance, this seems woefully out of place, like someone accidentally dropped the line from a eulogy right into the middle of a praise anthem. But it's not out of place at all. Seen from the right perspective, this is prayer. Cities like mine and maybe yours, they're increasingly havens for the young. We have a culture that celebrates the first half of life. Celebrates toned bodies and stylized wardrobes and career upward mobility. We drag on our youth as long as we possibly can. In a world like ours, the elderly are increasingly becoming a forgotten breed. And that's why in my 12 years in New York City, my favorite view of the Manhattan skyline was always the one from Calvary Cemetery in Queens. I was always strangely comforted when I would look across all those tombstones at the city spires that hung behind them. Because every one of those stones, it represented someone who was living fast and making plans and willing their preferred future. And now he or she is a memory. And the city's filled with a bunch of new people who are living even faster and making even more plans and willing even more agendas. And I can remember sitting in the back seat of a cab on my way home from LaGuardia Airport when I had so much on my mind, way too much to do and not nearly enough time. I had my device out scrambling to send emails from the cab and I looked up out the window and I saw that image. The city skyline with all those tombstones in front of it. And I remembered that, that, that everything that was playing through my head, everything that I felt like I had to do, all that I was so stressed and worried and anxious about, one day it would cease. When his breath departs, on that very day his plans perish. See, those tombstones for me, they're a reminder of how temporary I am, how temporary we all are. Psalm 39, another of David's prayers says this, Show me, Lord, my life's end and the number of my days. Let me know how fleeting my life is. You have made my days a mere handbreadth. The span of my years is as nothing before you. Everything is but a breath, even those who seem secure. That's what he prayed. And by now you know what David's doing when he prays. He's always undermining that same ancient conspiracy. The lie whispered before they plucked the fruit and sinned was, you will surely be like God. 
That is the lie that wreaks havoc on the human soul and the social order. So to pray, let me know how fleeting my life is, is not self-deprecating depression. It is self-aware victory. You you see, to turn our fast lives into stillness and our busy minds into solitude, it's an act of rebellion against the curse that has infected us and the air that we breathe. When we live in a constant state of noise, we lose perspective. We forget our mortality, and the consequences of that are of the furthest reaching variety. Live like this life, and this world is all you've got, and you will lose yourself trying to be everything for everybody. If being busy proves my importance, then I'll make myself busy. If wealth is a sign of freedom, then then I'll find a way to make more money. If knowing more people makes me feel like I matter, then I'll fill my schedule. It's a scarcity mindset. It's a constant state of fear that causes us to accumulate life rather than living it. Pretending you're eternal is a miserable, dehumanizing lie. It's the original lie. When we forget our mortality, we forget who we are, but when we remember our mortality, we recover who we are. You see, David was pleading with God to remind him that he's temporary, not because he's depressed, but because that's what showed him his true value. When I pray, when I see myself from God's perspective, I behold not only my own smallness, but also how valuable I am to God. David goes on to pray things like, God keeps count of my anxious tossings while I sleep. He bottles up every tear that I've ever shed. God's good thoughts about me outnumber the grains of sand on all the world's beaches. Where on earth do you get the chutzpah to pray like that? Well, he's free enough to admit that he's not in control. He's not all powerful. He's not enough, and he does not have to be. And he's not wallowing in his lack. He's celebrating it. Because he's not driven by fear to accumulate. He's living. He's free. Because when you see how great God is and how fleeting you are, you also see how profoundly you matter. That the creator of the world has time for you. The creator of the world delights in you. The creator of the world has hidden away redemption in you. Only when you see how small you are can you also see how profoundly you matter to this God. And there's an untouchable kind of freedom in that. This is Psalm 112. One more prayer from David. I can't, I just can't resist this one. Surely the righteous will never be shaken. They will be remembered forever. They will have no fear of bad news. Their hearts are steadfast trusting in the Lord. No fear of bad news. No fear plunging into their gut when they see that name pop up in their email inbox. No no fear buzzing around their idle mind when they've got no plans on a Saturday night. No anxiety about next week on Sunday evening. Can you even imagine that kind of freedom? Where on earth does that come from? Here, be still and know that I am God. Only by knowing him can we also know our true selves. Right near the end of the Old Testament, Israel was conquered by Babylon and they were forced to live in a foreign city steeped in a foreign culture. And it was there that rabbis translated David's prayers from Hebrew into Aramaic, from the language of their ancestry to the language of their captor, so that a generation who was being born in a foreign culture could remember who they really are. So that this foreign empire does not get to define my identity, but the God who created me gets to define my identity. And I wonder if David's prayers could still do the same for us. Children of a good and loving and eternal God living out our days in cities that are built on status and performance and perception. Can ancient prayers like the ones we've revisited this morning remind us who we really are so that we can live in a foreign culture by a truer kingdom? I'll land here. Almost everyone who recites Psalm 46 stops where we've stopped so far. Be still and know that I am God. But that's actually not where David and the sons of Korah stop. That's not where the prayer ends. Be still and know that I am God. What do you think follows? Be still and you'll be filled with peace. Be still and you'll lay down that heavy burden. Be still and you'll find rest for your soul. It's none of that. 
Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in all the earth. That's the destination of this prayer. That is the promise that we become aware of in holy stillness. Now, exalted in the earth, that means that God's presence becomes reality, plainly visible. It means love breaking out everywhere there's hate and kindness flooding competition until it sweeps it away, peace swallowing up fear, joy washing over jealousy, self-control calming rage and unwanted behavior. Everyone wants this. Everyone wants God to be exalted in the earth, even if they wouldn't use that vocabulary to name it. So here's the way God promises to get that done. Be still and know that I am God. See, the unexpected ending of Psalm 46 is that if we learn to be still and pray, the world around us gets renewed. You become a person of love poured out like a drink offering because you're a person forever being filled by the fountain of life himself. Historically, within the Russian church, a name was given to those who devoted themselves to a whole life of this stillness, this contemplative kind of prayer. They were called pustiniki. And these radical contemplatives, they, they withdrew into the wilderness and lived in isolation and perpetual solitude. And this word pustaniki, it's a term meaning being with everybody. Which seems like an odd name to give a group of people devoted to isolation. But as a part of their commitment, they embraced a life of intentional stillness, but they equally embraced a life of interruptibility a refusal to ever latch the doors on their homes, a, a commitment to remain constantly available to anyone and everyone and to make the need of their neighbor their highest priority. They were committed to a life that was equal parts intentional and interruptible. And Jesus was intentional about his own practice of stillness. I mean, his ministry began with 40 days of wilderness solitude, and then he slipped away from the crowd at night and in the early morning. He retreated into the company of, of the Father from the noise of both praise and criticism alike. In many ways, Jesus was a contemplative. But he also did allow himself to be interrupted to heal Bartimaeus and to care for the hemorrhaging woman and to have dinner with Zacchaeus. See, Jesus was intentional, and Jesus was interruptible. And there's a word for that way of living, unhurried. You see, in the end, this stillness and prayer I'm talking about, it's profoundly missional. Hurry is the great enemy of spiritual life in our day. Why? Because hurry kills love. It's hurry that lies behind our anger and our agitation and our self-centeredness. It's hurry that blinds our eyes to the truth that I am God's beloved. And that means that he or she is brother and sister. It's, it's hurry that's behind our anger and our agitation and, and our self-centeredness. God has to break our attachments to the world so that we can truly love the world. God has to break our attachments to the way of the world and the people who feed our own egos so that we can truly see others, know others, welcome others, and love others. The place that all of that work happens is called prayer. You see, stillness in the end is profoundly missional, and that's why prayer is not a self-care retreat. It may begin in isolation, but it ends in being with everybody. Stillness before God transforms us into unhurried love. It is in the stillness of silent prayer that God turns over the soil of our hearts. When we still our busy bodies and our busy minds and we arrive present and quiet before the God who is always present to us. It's there that he pulls apart our disordered desires, our distorted attachments, our codependencies and transforms us into other centered love. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. How does that happen? How does the kingdom come visible here and now? How does heaven come to earth in Guilford as it is in heaven? Be still and know that I am God. So if you would, just picture yourself on a beach. You just walked out past Coney Island. It's a brisk day in November. You see the sun hanging low on the horizon beyond you and the, the gray-blue water stretching out to the edge of the horizon. You can feel the cold wind cutting through your jacket. You see anything here more powerful than you? 
Great. Start there. Prayer starts there. Why don't we start right now? Will you stand with me? I just want to invite you to begin by being still. So find any posture of prayer that feels honest to you. For me, I find it helpful just to ground my two feet, to open up my hands in front of me. This is a posture that says uh, that, God, I'm coming open-handed, and I'm here to receive. It's a way of putting my body in a position that reminds my heart what it is I'm trying to do and who it is I'm trying to give my attention to. Be still. And in the stillness, we just begin to remember who God is. He's unhurried. He's not in a rush, not stressed, not anxious. He's intentional in his pursuit of you. And he's interruptible by whatever you're bringing to him today. He's slow to anger. He's not judgmental or disappointed or frustrated. That is not his primary nature. He's rich in mercy. So whatever lingers in the back of your mind as you drag your feet before him today, it does not linger in the back of his. His mercy is not cheap either. It's costly. He lived among us. He felt the weight of what you're carrying. He gave his whole self all that so what you're carrying might not weigh you down. He's abounding in steadfast love. God is overflowing with love, with a steadfast kind of love that will not quit and cannot be quenched. There is no grade. There is no evaluation. There are no conditions. Even now, you're being washed in the endless fountain of the love that he lavishes upon you. Be still. Remember who God is. And remember who you are. So what are you carrying today? What are you anxious about or distracted by? What insecurity has been pinged for you? What fear is trying to wrestle you to the ground? What accusations rattling around your head? What circumstances are you trying to control? What moment from yesterday are you still reliving? Or moment from tomorrow are you already living? What are you carrying? And how might it look different when you slow yourself down in the presence of this God? This God who sees how small you are and yet calls you beloved. And now, from that place, pray. I have no idea how we're meant to close, but I'd love just to lead a moment of ministry. Is that okay? Are we meant to sing anymore? No. Beautiful. So I'd love just to invite a few to receive ministry. Because as I was teaching, I just heard the whisper of the Spirit over a couple of things. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to name two invitations. And if either one of them uh, feels like God's speaking to you, I'm just going to invite you to come forward to receive prayer. And it'll be the simplest thing. I'm not inviting you forward to share your story with someone or to invite some stranger into the deepest parts of your life. I'm inviting you forward to respond to Jesus Because in my experience, there's something about moving our bodies that allows him to deepen his transformation in our life. I think it's vulnerability. I think it's that moving our bodies makes us vulnerable. And that when we become vulnerable, we open up more space for him to move and work in us. So I'm just going to name these two invitations. And and then I'm going to invite you to move your body, to make yourself vulnerable. Why? So that you can say, more, Lord, do more in me of what you're already doing. So the first is just what I named in the midst of teaching, that I think that there's 
some folks in here today, or maybe just one person, that, that even as you arrive, you are wrestling with anxiety today. And that the cure to your anxiety is not uh, an escape or, or a run to a coping mechanism. The cure to your anxiety is to see your life in light of the God who loves you and pursues you. And so if that's you, I'm going to invite you to respond in just a moment, just to hold your anxiety before him and say, God, would you reveal yourself to me right here in the midst of this? But the second is that when I mention interruptibility, I think that there's some in the room today that you have cultivated spiritual habits of being intentional. And you do have well-ordered rhythms of prayer and the pursuit of God in your life. But you've grown increasingly uninterruptible. And there's this revelation today of a God who is intentional, but is equal parts interruptible. And you just want to say, God, would you make me interruptible again? To love people as you love them. So if that's you, if either of those words resonates with you, if you want to bring anxiety before him today, or you want to hold uh, yourself for him and say, God, make me interruptible in the place of my intentionality, then would you just make your way to the front of this room right now and then just hold yourself in the same posture of prayer? Yeah, come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. God's speaking to you today. I want you to know God only speaks because he wants to act. There's no separating his speech from his action. He's a God who says, let there be light, and then bam, there's light. And so we move in a way to join our action to his action. To say, God, I hear you speaking, and I want you to act. Would you come, Holy Spirit? And so if you're a, a leader or a community member or whatever the right words are around here in this church, I just would love to invite you as we respond to come forward and to bless in prayer those who are responding. Just to simply lay a hand on their shoulder and say, more, Lord, more of what you're already doing. There's a lot of promises in Scripture about the power of laying on hands to bless the work that God is doing in, in the life of another that actually increases it. It's not an asking of someone to share their story or an interrupting of someone's moment with God. It's a, Lord, I, I see my brother or sister in their moment of vulnerability before you, and I pray that what they're responding to, that you would bring in a moment of transformation that only you can do right now in their life. So I'm gonna stop talking now. Allow us just to respond for a moment. And then I'm sure there's someone that will come and do whatever they're supposed to do. So thank you, Lord, that you're living and active, that you're work among us. I pray particularly over those that are responding today. I pray, Lord, for something so much better than a sermon. I pray for the transformation of the Holy Spirit in their lives. So come, Holy Spirit. We welcome you now. We love your presence, God. We love your presence, God. Amen. The Spirit's just moving, doing a deep work. It's not just that we've heard a brilliant talk, but this is a raw nerve. People are weeping. This is important soul work. So we bless what you're doing here, Spirit of the living God. And I, I just, um, there's such spiritual dynamics at play here. This is not just about making choices to do better time management, but we break the very spirit of Pharaoh that has driven and driven and driven some of us to a kind of slavery to productivity. We break that spirit with the blood of the Passover. And we speak over 
those of you at the front, liberty and a new freedom in the name of Jesus. And I speak to your hearts, for the scriptures say that there is eternity in your heart. You are not a mortal dying being, you are an eternal being. And so breathe deep and relax. And I want to pray particularly for those of you at the front who the, the, the exhaustion and the drive and the inability to be present comes from a very deep place in your own childhoods and the expectations and the craving for approval. And I ask even that generational disapproval and drive would be broken in the strong name of Jesus Christ whose only father was in heaven and so we say it is for freedom that you've been set free intentional and interruptible. Um, I, I'm sensing, this isn't for even necessarily someone at the front, but this message today for you was actually less about prayer than the way you parent your children. There's a strong call to a greater stillness and presence with your children. I'm not going to ask you to put your hand up because I don't want any shame in this room. But I will pray for you now that today would be different. And that would give you the energy for tomorrow morning with the, you know, maybe even the two bank holidays are God's gift to help you break some cycles. But I pray a grace upon you to be more present and to listen better to your children. Amen. What a fabulous message, so good. Uh, now we're going to be hearing from Natalie Stafford-Williams, who's going to be talking to us a little bit about prayer. Hi everyone, I'm Natalie and I'm the prayer coordinator for Emmaus Road. And today we are going to be praying for Unique and United UK, a prayer resource for racial justice. As a team made up of members of Emmaus Road, Gas Street, Norjavan and Southampton Lighthouse International, we are super passionate about seeing God's kingdom come to earth as it is in heaven in the area of racial unity. And as we look to Revelation 7, where it talks about every tribe, people, tongue, um, coming together to worship the Lord our God, we are so aware that over the centuries that that hasn't been the case. There have been people who have been oppressed because of their race, because of their ethnicity, um, within the church and outside the church and therefore we want to help the UK Christians, the UK church to pray about these things because it's hard and sometimes we don't have the words to pray but also to empower to act as well. So with that being said I have three prayer points for the team, for the resource itself and for Wildfires Youth. For the team um, that we would continue to be united and that as we continue to look for um, other people to join the group, that um, conversations with church leaders and with other Christians will go well and that would, they would really catch the essence of what this resource could really be. The second thing is the resource itself that all the logistics will go well um, and that we'll be able to troubleshoot properly just in case anything should go a little bit wobbly, um, but also that it would be so God breathed. We don't want to put out a resource that God isn't in. So therefore we would just want to pray for God's voice and his presence to be all over this because we know that he's the only one who can change hearts and minds. And thirdly, wildfires youth. We have been given the exciting opportunity to lead a lab there. So pray for the youth that they would catch on to Jesus's heart for justice and also that we would all learn from each other and would really powerfully encounter Jesus. So let's pray. 
Father God, I thank you that you are King of Kings, that you reign over everything, that you are almighty and powerful. And Lord, we come before you with these prayer requests. Lord, I ask that you would continue to keep the unique and united team united, Lord. That any division that may try to come in, that it shall be rebuked in the name of Jesus. And Lord, I pray that as we expand, as we look for other people to join the team, that you would bring the right people. People who have a heart to see every tribe and every tongue and every nation come together in perfect unity to worship you. And Lord, I pray for this resource that you would breathe on this. We don't want to do this without you, Lord, and we know that you are the changer of hearts and minds. So would you speak through every single word? Would you work through every single person who is going to be helping us to produce this from videographers and script writers and all of that stuff? Lord, would this whole process and the, um, pro and the culmination of it, Father God, let it all be God-breathed. And Lord, we pray for wildfires youth, that the youth would catch your heart for justice and that we would learn from them, that they would learn from us and that there would be a an encounter with you in that lab, Lord. That we would all encounter you in a powerful, powerful way. So Lord, we thank you. We bless your name and we ask all of this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, everyone. If you'd like to find out more about Unique and United, follow us on Instagram at Unique and United UK, or we have a little bit of information on the Amaze Road website. So God bless you and have a wonderful week. Thank you guys so much for joining us. We're so happy you're here. Uh, keep subscribed, keep in the loop of what we're up to, and we'll see you next week.